one of the more successful people on the floor and pulled me like three months into the job and was like, Brittany, you sound like you're 15 on the phone. No one's going to buy it from you. You need to figure it out. I'm not going to buy software for my daughter. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Analysis Paralysis. Today, I am here with Brittany Perez. She is the manager of the account management team at Copper, and more importantly, one of the main reasons as to why we are as close as we are with Copper today. She was actually our main representative when we first signed up for Copper about three years ago, and she's been growing along with the company back when they only had a, a few dozen employees. So so we talked about everything from where she got started, how she even got involved with Copper. She was working actually at Intuit beforehand. They had acquired a company that she was working for. So she's been around the startup space quite a bit, uh, has seen some mergers and acquisitions and things like that. And then of course, Copper growing from a, a 28 employee company when she started to now hundreds of employees tens of millions of venture backing and there's so much more that copper is is going to do they're nipping at the heels of salesforce at the moment so she's been along for the ride she absolutely loves it there and this was such an enjoyable conversation that we had enjoy the episode Okay, so you've worked at Intuit. You've worked at some, you know, a larger company that definitely have uh, success and processes and systems and lots of employees. But how did you go from like, you know, Intuit to then going over to a startup? And how do you even get involved with Intuit in the first place? That's a great question. Um, I think, you know what? I'm going to look, look at my own LinkedIn right now. Yeah, <laughs> so reminder, what's funny yeah. is <laughs> um, the company that I started with in, I think it was July 2012, was called Demand Force. Okay. And that company had just been acquired by Intuit three months before I started. Uh, okay. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, the acquisition was, I think, um, just short of $500 million. So it was... Wow. Very, very successful. Yeah. So you, um, you've been space. through like a, a, a successful acquisition or I didn't like your, was that your first <laughs> job? No. Oh my gosh. I actually worked in this same building that I'm in right now. <laughs> um, <Wow>. <laughs> seven <laughs> years ago. Yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, actually this month is, would be my, when I started seven years ago, it was a, it was a, uh, technology recruiting company. So okay. I was recruiting for these insane engineering positions that I had no idea what I was talking about. But um, <laughs> so, so it was recruiting for six months, got promoted into the client facing account manager position, T did not do well, basically thought I had no future in sales. I was terrible. Um, and then one day, I saw one of my um, my buddies from college is working at this really cool company called Demand Force, and I looked into it, and I had a couple of their friends there as well, and I was like, "What's going on over there? <laughs> this looks really interesting." And I noticed that the original recruiter that had placed me at my first job was now an in-house recruiter at Demand Force. So, mm. got in touch with her, and um, she ended up getting me my second job <laughs> oh, wow. after getting me the first. Yeah. So. So what did Demand Force do? Yeah, it's software as a service. So basically, um, verticalized software. I worked in the veterinary space, but it served veterinary, medical, um, lifestyle, like hair salons, auto shops, and it plugged into their um, their customer system. So where all of that data was stored, and it targeted three major areas. The first was communication. So it could send a text message asking you to confirm your appointment for the next day. Mm. Okay. Um, second was marketing. You could send out segmented newsletters to um, vet clients asking them to come in for fluffies, you know, shots in the, mm -hmm. the next year. And the third was reputation um, with small businesses that we targeted reviews online for their biggest pain um, and, and typically detrimental to businesses. So mm -hmm. we helped get them positive reviews online through Google, Yelp, and other sources. So it was all in one thing that was pretty ahead of it um, at the time when I started. So when you were working there, what really was like your role, like your day-to-day? 
Yeah. <laughs> um, I got hired as an account executive. Um, I was nowhere near qualified for that. I should have okay. been uh, one of the <laughs> on the lead gen team. Uh, but I somehow blew this presentation away and all of the, the major leaders in the room um, thought that I was well suited for the account executive position. Oh, so wow. I never really closed before. They didn't know that at the time. Mm. Uh, so I came in super green, had no idea what I was doing. Um, and I think uh, you, you caught this on one of our um, videos that Copper's recorded, mm-hmm. but <laughs> uh, one of the, one of the, um, the, more, the more successful people on the floor had pulled me like three months into the job and was like, Brittany, you sound like you're 15 on the phone. No one's going to buy it from you. You need to figure it out. I'm not going to buy software for my daughter. So oh, you know, here's, wow. your, here's your warning. Um, and I took that very seriously. And so I spent my own time just – really practicing and furthering my education on, on sales and what I could do to make it better. So, so, so I mean, so, hearing something like that, it, it's essentially criticism at its purest form. <laughs> and how, how did it actually affect you initially? Like, did you immediately take it and say, you know, I'm going to run with this. I like, I understand that this is trying to make me better or was it like, you know, that's kind of offensive um, um, I, and, and maybe demoralizing. Like, how did you actually feel? Definitely the former. Um, I played competitive softball year round for about 13 years. Okay. And I'd had that same criticism before. And I took the criticism and then turned it into, it was like between uh, middle school and, and high school and I ended up making the varsity team my first year. Oh, so wow. it, so I've, I've heard, you know, mm. I've been behind the game a little bit before, but I, I basically took it the same way that I did because, <laughs> I was hey, playing you, sports. You, so, just- <laughs> so now you've had like enough good things happen from – being criticized that it's like it's very clear that you should take it with a grain of salt and and grow from it versus letting it knock you down because there's a lot of people that do let it you know affect them personally and it can actually hurt them quite a bit and maybe they they aren't as motivated to push forward and learn things and do things because of it so yeah that's definitely motivational yeah Yeah. and I I tell that story quite often to to rep that I'm managing that are just getting started and get Mm -hmm. frustrated like it's just the beginning so yeah. yeah, I think oh, it that's helps great. <laughs> so then yeah. how, how did Copper come into play? So you were working at Intuit. I mean, tell me a little bit about Intuit as well. So you were working yeah. there for what, three years? Yeah, three years. Yeah. So I moved up pretty quickly. Um, I, I started as an AE, um, got promoted to senior AE in under a year. Um, and then I actually, uh, I, I made it to President's Club and met the CEO of Intuit at oh, wow. that President's Club in Ireland that year. Yeah, it was really exciting. Like it was <laughs> How do you make it to President's Club? What what is that? Yeah, so we were one of um the the major segments of Intuit. So QuickBooks, TurboTax, like all that kind of okay. stuff. We pulled the top people from each of those and then invited um I think it was like 70 people to Dublin for President's Club. Jeez. Um yeah, and then there was this is so crazy. There was like a cocktail party for all of the, with, within that 70, like one or two from each of the segments. And we got to hang out with the CEO of Intuit. It was that's wild. Oh, that's, <laughs> it was that's totally wild. Yeah. It was, I, I still look back and it was just like this insane experience and Intuit's such a great company. So, so it was, when, oh, go ahead. When, well, when you talk about uh, AE, like account executive, uh, yeah. I think that's something that's so second nature to you because that's been so much of your career. Yeah. And it's funny because I've worked with a lot of AEs, like I've they've I've had AEs, like account you know managers and things like that yeah. working with me. But even so, like maybe to to bring people in a little bit more, say that I'm an Intuit user, I'm using QuickBooks Online. Would I be talking to you at any point in time, or like what what would be my interaction with you as a customer? Great question. It's all new business, so we're basically like the first point of contact for someone that's interested in adopting QuickBooks or demand force in their business. Okay. So, account manager or customer success manager is typically post sale, um, working to the expand the account and better the experience for the current customer. But account executive is very much new business and um, client acquisition. Okay. And then, yeah. so, so you know, Copper comes into play here, and this is kind of where I uh, got connected with you in some regard as well. So how, yeah. how was Copper, how did that even come to play? You're working into it for a while. <laughs> Things are going well. You're moving up yeah. the ranks. They're a large company. You know, there's yeah. there's a lot of room to grow, I'm, I'm guessing, and I'm sure things yeah. were going fairly well. Yeah. Um, so I ended up, I think I, I got to a point where I thought I was just kind of capped it into it. And Okay. Um, I didn't really see the next step. And so I, 
actually quit um, oh, wow. my job at Intuit. Um, oh my gosh, was it? I think it was in 2014, okay. and ended up um, getting a call from our general manager of Demand Force that was at Intuit, and they uh, they counteroffered. <laughs> wow. So I ended up staying for another year as a sales engineer, um, opening up a new part of the business that was focused on um, like, how do we sell demand force and how can we optimize mm. that? So no longer customer facing, basically controlling behind the scenes, like how we sell the product. And how, um, did, how did you feel about that type of role? So going from a customer facing role <laughs> to now, now, you know, not. I hated it. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> was not meant for that. Yeah. It was a lot of like project management, which I'm doing actually now, but I had no experience before. It was mm-hmm. totally customer facing before. So I was kind of lost. And, um, it was this new department that really, I think it was just created as, as a way to get me to stay. Mm-hmm. Um, but really just had no roots in the company. And what ended up happening is, um, into it ended up divesting demand force about a year and a half later and six months before that actually happened, they laid off a bunch of people at demand force. So, so I've, I've actually, I don't even know what the, the term divesting is. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing based on what you're saying, so yeah. they, they acquired and then they decided that they no longer wanted. Um, Correct. Okay. Oh, wow. Yeah. So how does yeah. that work? Yeah. So they, they sold it to a new buyer called internet brands. Okay. Um, and basically just demand force did not fit into the Intuit ecosystem. Intuit is a household name. People know QuickBooks, they know quick and they know TurboTax. Mm-hmm. Demand force is and always will be something that you need to prospect. You need to go find people. They have no idea who you are. So you're building value from zero on day one, trying to get someone to buy the product. Mm. That's not what TurboTax or um, yep. QuickBooks are. So just didn't fit into the the inbound <laughs> ecosystem that Intuit is. And so they sold it to internet brands. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so uh, I was given, I was one of six people that were given uh, the choice to stay. Um, and we were like 150 people laid off. Um, wow. So we got the choice to stay. I had to go back into my previous position as in sales. Mm-hmm. Or I could take a severance package and leave. And at that point... I just felt like my time was up. Mm-hmm. And so um, I chose to leave. Okay. Yeah. So so, um, so where did you're, – you're, you're no longer working anywhere. Did you just start looking for jobs at this point or did you want to take some time off? Okay. <laughs> I was just I – I feel like I was so overwhelmed from what had happened and yeah. just kind of burned out. So sure. it was about a month into fun employment as I called it. And I had a girlfriend that had gotten the same offer as me at Demand Force and took the severance package as well. Mm. And so we're chatting and she's like, hey, um, one of our – old head of sales, um, who worked at demand force as well, just took this new position at Prosperworks, And, uh, I just got offered a senior AE role there as well. Uh, what do you think about talking to him? And I was like, okay, well, I literally have zero options right now. I haven't even started to look. Mm-hmm. Um, so totally happy to have a conversation. Yeah. <laughs> so I had, I didn't really have any exposure to this person. Um, at Demand Force, he worked in a different, he was head of sales and services and I was in health. So I think I met him like twice over the course of three years. So I chatted with him. It sounded like a really cool opportunity. And my interview consisted of coming into ProsperWorks, which was then 28 people. Wow. Um, and just talking to our now COO, Sean, and our CEO, Sean. Mm-hmm. And it was just immediately sold on um, the company, the vision, the idea, the product, Um, and then just speaking with both of them, it was, John talked a lot about yoga and, um, he just recently traveled to Asia and just like super at peace and Zen. I really, really love that. Like he's very, very intense and driven, but like kind of put me at ease and it just made sense to, to take the position. So clearly you were using some type of sales software, a CRM of sorts at demand force. What yeah. were you, I'm guessing something like a, a Salesforce or maybe. Force. You, yep. Okay. So, <laughs> so you're using this for, for quite some time. I just had a yeah. quick curiosity was uh, demand force using Salesforce prior or once you got acquired by Intuit, is that when you switched over to Salesforce? 
we were we'd be using it the entire time. Okay. So yeah. you have this experience in, in the system for so long and then you go over to ProsperWorks <laughs> and I'm, I'm curious because like really when, when you were first starting at ProsperWorks, it, not that they had a minimal viable product off, but like it, it was pretty substantial even in 2015 at that point, but there was still a lot that was missing versus like a Salesforce. So how sure. did you feel looking at it and, and using it? Um, the, the thing that really spoke to me was the automatic email ingestion okay. and just doing you know, calendar events. Like everything just came from Google automatically. I rarely used Salesforce mm. and coming into that job, there had been people that had worked the deals that I was handed when I came in. I had no idea what was going on. Mm. It was just this, this naked profile of minimal information. And I had, to, I remember at that time I had to copy and paste emails in oh, from, no. Gmail into Salesforce. And obviously that never happened. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, even when I left into it, everything was in my brain. So I've heard years later that <laughs> people that got handed my accounts had a hell of a time <laughs> figuring out where they were because uh, there was no information in there. It was yeah. just all years in my brain. So okay. This yeah the the idea of ProsperWorks spoke to my soul. You have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, that that's that's super interesting, and that's it's probably exactly yeah. who the type of person they were looking for as well. I yeah. Mean, it, I'm, yeah. Definitely. Based on so you're you're one of 28 people at that point that were there. Um, I'm really curious to hear how things kind of were at that point to kind of where they are now because I, I want to jump forward a lot as we're talking through because then there's a lot of really interesting stuff about automation yeah. and process yep. that I want to discuss. Um, so what was it like going from a company that w had 28 employees that obviously had some potential, but even venture backing, there probably wasn't a crazy amount at that point. And yeah, uh, we, we it was just different. Very, very Seven million at the time. So okay. I think I came in like right after that. So very, very early. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So So what was it like... Uh, I guess being at a startup, you, you kind of worked at a startup, but when you started working for the startup, you guys got acquired fairly quickly. And then all of a sudden you're working for Intuit, which is a massive, yeah. massive company. So what was your feeling too? Because like as a startup, um, in terms of where you can grow, I guess being so early on, you can kind of grow a lot, but at the same time, uh, it's also difficult because people are kind of in their areas and you like there weren't that many layers that you can move up to. Right. Because it was just more it was a smaller company. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, when I came in, it was very much a startup. Um, I think Demand Force had 500 people when I came on board. So this oh, was wow. very, oh, very different. Okay. We were all in one room. Um, I can actually see the building across the street from the original building we were in. Um, and I think I was the fourth or fifth AE. So we had five AEs and two SDRs, three SDRs, sorry. Um, and then. And, uh, and what's an SDR? Oh, sorry. Uh, a sales development representative. Okay, so gotcha. they call, set the demos that the account executives performed. Yeah. Okay. So when we, when we first started kind of working together, cause I think uh, it was. Yeah. It was around like the the start maybe January of 2016. So you you had been there for six months or so. Um, we were working together in some regard, in which I, I think you were maybe my account executive, and that's where we first started kind of yeah. working together. But then yeah. very quickly you started moving up uh, throughout the process over there. And I, I still remember when you got your first um, you know position that that you raised to a different position. I was very happy for you. And at the same time, I'm like, but wait a minute, this means I'm not going to actually be working with you anymore. And we've already been building kind of this, you know, this relationship, this business relationship. And I think it was one of those moments because I remember talking to my buddy about it where I'm like, you know, I'm getting super close with ProsperWorks. I want to partner with them and I'm trying to work on it. Like they don't have a partnership program yet, but I was really getting involved with you guys. And I started kind of seeing building my business on what you guys offer because I loved it so much. And then I saw you kind of slip away. Then I'm like, wait a minute. Like, I'm being assigned, like, a new rep. And I think this is Nicholas at that point. Yeah. And partially, like, I, you know, I was excited. But then I think that's the one of the, honestly, one of the first times through my business uh, career that I got to a point realizing that my relationship with a company is not like I have a relationship with ProsperWorks. It's actually the people at the company. So when, when I – when I'm like, I'm no longer talking to you, I'm starting fresh with a new person. And it almost feels like that everything that I had with ProsperWorks is now starting from scratch. It was a, I, it was a I tough thing. I never thought of that. that. Wow. 
I, yeah. I, I teach my reps that same idea. Like, you know, if your point of contact leaves and you're kind of screwed, mm-hmm. the relationship then goes away. <laughs> it's, and it's a massive thing because I think there's the, the shift that you guys have been talking a lot about, which is the relationship era. And I've always loved being in B2B versus B2C because – in my mind, B2B, it's so much easier to build a relationship with someone. Whereas B2C, they may may buy from you once or twice. But in B2B, like you're probably building a long-term relationship where possible. And I have a couple of clients right now that I've had for six, seven, eight years, and I don't see them going away anytime soon. So now here's like an eight-year relationship I built with some people. You're not really going to have that in B2C. So that's one of the things that I, I realized that I used to be super, super introverted and not really talk to people, nor did I really enjoy talking to people. And then I I, I started doing this shift the more I worked in B2B where I'm like, I actually love the relationship aspect, which is so strange because I felt like that was the one area that I didn't like. I wasn't comfortable and I wasn't comfortable in sales or anything. So um, I want to hear a little bit about like, I guess, the relationship area and what that means for you guys and how you teach that. And I guess, what, what does that even mean to you exactly? Yeah, I, I do want to make a comment though. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you, you're now. I mean, so many people at Copper know you, and it's almost like it's whenever we see you on a forum on Zapier or Harvest or Trello, it's just it's like, oh, yep, Alex is all over it. It's we know. I really love it. And oh, also, I appreciate that. Our product team, and then like Gab when she was here in marketing, it's you've really um, you've taken it just so much beyond what it was just working with one person and that's really it's been really cool to see on the partner level I think you've kind of been like the pioneer for what Shannon and Mike have been doing oh that Um, that that means a ton to me and no I mean (laughs) it's so true it's so cool too because like at the end of the day what what even allowed me to do a lot of this has been uh copper really like having those relationships in there and reminding me to follow up and like I have this little uh under under the the person contact I have like a uh, mentor for one and then I have like keep in, or I just have a keep in touch, for example. And every now yeah. and then I'll jump through my list of keep in touch and it's just kind of like you haven't talked to this person in 200 days and you're one of the people that I had in there that's like yeah. that I had checked to keep in touch. So it's like, man, yeah. I haven't, I haven't, since I haven't been working directly with you, I haven't yeah. talked to Brittany in 150 days. Like yeah. I should at least just reach out and just see how things are going. And I think doing that type of stuff strengthens the relationship because I've had people reach out to me as well that it's like dude how do you always remember to like keep in touch with me and I'm like I forget I'm terrible with it like you're giving me too much credit it's the system that you know obviously I have to jump into the system and remember to do it and I'm the one making the connection but at the same point like I would have never remembered when I look through that list I have people that are labeled as like mentors that I totally forgot even existed as bad as that sounds but you deal with so (laughs) many people on a daily basis that you need something to manage that I think you can't you can't remember more than like 230 relationships well that you have and you deal yeah. with a lot more than 230 people over the course of a year <laughs> especially yeah. in B2B yep I think you nailed it it's just like it's we're talking about a way to bring people brands and customers together in like an always on kind mm-hmm. of ecosystem uh, as opposed to like hitting them with all of this passive marketing material, they just kind of become like desensitized to what they're receiving. Mm-hmm. Um, but it just, it brings it, you know, from passive to like, we're so engaged with everyone mm-hmm. and we want to, we still want to automate obviously, but like, we're really trying to push like the hands on, we're talking to you, we're involved in the experience, we're building strong relationships. And that's from, you know, the first time that you talk to us all the way into like a, a, a customer like Hauser that's been with us for three years mm-hmm. and talks to us weekly. So oh, that's geez. kind of what okay. we're, we're looking to do. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, there's something with the the, the general sales aspect that's really interesting because I've, I've talked to uh, my uncle actually quite a bit <laughs> because he's been working at a company for man, 45 years, he's very close to retirement and they've been using Salesforce, especially yeah. when they put Salesforce into place. He just, he hated it because he was, he's explains to me all the time where he was just like, it took something like sales, which used to be so relationship based. You'd go and get dinner with someone and you yeah. know that they'd buy from you at the end of it or whatever. And, and yeah. what sales was, was so different from what it is now. And now there's no relationships and things like that is what he's saying. And it's, it's really interesting to hear him, you know, saying a lot of this to me, especially when I'm, I feel so the opposite, which relationships are still everything. It's just 
different. But I think when technology came into play, people obsessed, uh, these companies obsessed with like, how do we automate this relationship or how do we automate the sales process? And it obsessed over like a, a, a computer having a relationship with a person, which is not yeah. what want people want. And now we're kind of in this really magical area, uh, era, I guess you can say that the relationship era, to me at least, is that we now have these awesome tools and things available and these bots and this automation, but we get to choose when it makes sense to leverage it. And, and maybe it's only 30% of the time, whereas yep. before we were at like 70, 80% of the time, which just did not make sense because humans don't want to do business with computers yet. And maybe yep. we never want to. So it's, it's really interesting for me to see what you guys are doing to, you know, I guess, automate. And when you're choosing that, it should be more a, a personal connection. And I, I'd be really curious on your end. So you say that you're keeping in contact with Howes. You know, what part of that is automated in some regard for just like a general yeah. email? Like, hey, we haven't talked in a bit and let's go over <laughs> your account versus having reps reaching out or, or Howes reaching to you. Like, what, what does that connection relationship look like? Yeah. So Hauser is, we have one single point of contact. Um, and then that's branched into other people that are now involved in the relationship. And I think what we've really done is we brought on, um, a customer education manager who's in charge of really just keeping that communication flowing, but in an automated, informative, easy way. Mm -hmm. So we found out that we were just like, we were, we were contacting all of our prospects so much. Like our SDR team has cadences, um, they go out every couple of days when someone is in a trial of copper okay. and that communication really never stops until they make the purchase. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, combined with phone calls and uh, maybe even a zoom meeting where you can see their face. Mm. Um, but then once they become a customer uh, we're really relying on the onboarding team and then the customer support team, but like, what are we sending to them in between those conversations that keeps the relationship moving? Okay. And so that's really where we focused on. We basically just revamped our entire support channel. So you can go online and see all these awesome articles. And we're keeping those automated as well to the customer. So it comes directly from who your CSM is. So that's the customer success mm -hmm. manager. And we'll make sure that those emails are coming from Heather. They're coming from Jason. And they're addressed to the person, giving them helpful articles based on what industry that they're in or what their focus is at the time or how long they've been with us. And those messages are going to vary from someone that just signed up to someone that's been with us for a couple of years and is already very entrenched in the system. So, so when you first went to Copper, was there already like a lot of processes in place or has that just been, you know, changing constantly and, and have you had any involvement in that? Um, I think what my favorite example of this is when I first got here, um, people would just write into sales at prosperworks.com okay. asking about the system and it's very much a new lead. And at that time when I came in, it was the first to touch it and respond to the email was the one that got to take the lead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we really had no cadence or okay. rules of engagement around that. But now we have a very robust round robin assignment in Marketo. And that took you know X number of months or even over a year to build, perfect, and, and polish. So we've really come a long way. <laughs> very very <laughs> roughly, because I like this is this is definitely an area where it's totally out of my my um, experience of like you explaining what you guys are doing, obviously there's a certain level where probably you can't talk too, too much to it because that's some of that in a sense is like IP. So I'm trying to be very careful about some of that. Um, but very generally, because I like I'm, I'm the same way and a lot of my clients are the same way where, yeah, a sales request comes in and the first one on the sales team that responds to it is, is typically the one that gets it. And it kind of makes sense when you're a small business with two, three sales reps or, or maybe even one like, you know, myself. So what what is the, this round robin that's happening very roughly? Like what what is kind of happening to, to break that up? Is, is Betsy only able to get three uh, sales requests per week or like what, what, it, what does it do? Yeah. It's like, it's really like any traditional sales organization. You can do it based on territory or okay. you can do it based on uh, lead allotment. So let's say that you have three different levels of account executive. They all have different quotas. Mm -hmm. You're obviously going to give the highest quota more leads because they have a higher number they need to get ah, to. Okay. So, um, and we've actually extended this to our customers as well. So um, Jack James, who's the yep. manager of professional services, is the one that really built this out and allowed it to just to service our customers as well. So okay. you can get pretty specific on what kind of things dictate where the lead goes. 
Okay. So so from a bunch of these sales processes that you've been dealing with, especially a copper, uh, mm-hmm. is there one that stands out to you as just being like almost feeling kind of magical in a sense? So you know, the lead comes in and it gets imported in the system and I'm sure it probably runs, uh, does a quick check on like company size and, and maybe depending on that too, it might help assign the proper rep if it's a small vers- business versus an enterprise or whatever. But yeah. is there anything like maybe in the process that it just like it happens and you just feel so good about how how well it, it worked? Oh my gosh. Uh, that's got to be the data enrichment part. Of okay. our- so, I mean, this has always been a part of Copper. Um, and the coolest thing is that we we partnered with Full Contact and EverContact a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. And when a new uh, record is added to our system, it will look that domain up online and pull any of the social media information that exists on Google into that record. Mm-hmm. So instead of spending, you know, 10, 15 minutes looking online for new information about that lead that I just got, the system's going to enrich it for you. Mm-hmm. And it's gotten to the point where it's just so amazingly accurate at this point. It's it's awesome. I can go in and look and see how many employees they currently have. Um, it'll pull a, a paragraph from Google and let me know what the, the company mission is, where they're located, when they were founded. Um, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, all that information is going to be automatically added to the record based on the domain. Mm, okay. Yeah. And th- that's definitely one of the areas that even even the LinkedIn profile is something that I think is accessed so often, especially when you're trying to sell B2B. You kind of want to have an idea of how long they've been in business for, uh, what their role is at the company, and read a little bit about it. And LinkedIn is just so invaluable to, to grab that information. And 99% of the time, like LinkedIn link uh, exists when I add someone to Copper, which is just beautiful. It just makes things a little bit easier easier. Um, yep. So in general, I'm trying to understand as well about what your, how have your positions at Copper changed? Because um, we've talked a little bit about it, but so where you first started and then you, you kept moving up in the company a little bit and are, so like, what what are you doing now versus where you started and, and what does your job kind of description your day-to-day look like now? Yeah. So I um, worked as a senior account executive for about a year and 10 months and then got promoted into um, the manager of that account executive team. So I took over the team that I was on formerly, mm-hmm. um, which is really interesting. Um, and then I did that for about a year, um, did, did pretty well. Uh, and then we, we decided that there was this whole untapped market where our current customers, super healthy, um, maybe there was the opportunity to go and identify new teams within that current company that could use copper. I think that's the great thing about it. We could have like even internally in our own instance, like our biz dev team uses it. Our SDR team uses it. The account executive team uses it. Our marketing team uses it. um, Our onboarding team uses it training. So it can support all of these unique workflows. And that just really backed this idea of introducing copper to new teams in current customer instances. And, so and, that's what um, I'm now doing since June of this year, just building that team out and really um, testing this idea. And if it's true, that we can go and find this entire untapped market of what we call expansion. That's honestly one of the things that I love so much about Copper. And that's when you <laughs> first get started, it's it's a sales platform that you hear CRM, it's sales. And that's what you always think. But once mm-hmm. you kind of dive in, and I think the more that we worked with the platform, you start seeing that you can use the opportunities section with the many different pipelines as different processes uh, for different even departments and divisions. So I pretty much don't have, I don't have any clients at this point who don't use um the opportunity section for more than than sales. So it's normally sales and project management and maybe even service, for example. So it's just like once that sale is completed, in a sense, in your mind, you may think, okay, well, now we're done with the CRM. We're going to move to the project management software. But a Mm -hmm. lot of clients of mine, like you can actually do project management from inside of it. So how many active projects do we have going on right now? Uh, Do we need to order materials? Well, that's that's a part here. And you can kind of move through the process and see all that information within Copper. And I think you look at a lot of these competitors, like the HubSpot, the Pipe Drive, and things like that, and they're very much geared around. I, I, even Infusionsoft, they they don't even yeah. have. I was I was talking to this guy Kelsey Bratcher on an older episode, yeah. and he he worked for Infusionsoft and 
He's uh, worked with their product for quite some time now. I think like eight or probably a decade at this point. And <laughs> we were talking about, I was like, so opportunities, how are you guys using that for like other internal processes and things like that? And he's like, what? We don't even use opportunities. Like the deals aspect is terrible. <laughs> like it's, and I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait, wait. Like this is the core at what I build so many of my clients on. How are you <laughs> using a CRM and not using opportunities for process. And it blew my mind yeah. that, you know, you hear all these other CRMs that exist and it's, it, they're, they're so different in so many different ways. That doesn't mean that copper is the perfect solution for everything, but sure. there's definitely like our company, at least, I think it's mirroring kind of what you guys are doing as well. <laughs> looking at existing companies and seeing where we can expand further to other departments. Cause it doesn't just need to be the sales department that, that leverages copper and, and, and does more with it. So yep. how did your team even find that? Like, have you learned from customers maybe using the opportunity section in crazy ways or did you guys start doing it or what, <laughs> what made you realize that you can expand yeah. outside of it? I think it was internal. Okay. Um, our onboarding team was, who was, was one person when I started. <laughs> mm, wow. Um, just started using it to manage the onboarding process. And I remember the day when they announced that you could have unique fields in each pipeline. So uh. in the beginning, you had to have the same fields in every pipeline, which was great at the time because it was even, you know, ahead of the game. But I remember the day that they were like, you know what, you can now choose what fields go into what pipeline. And we were just like, oh, yeah, wow, <laughs> this okay. is on. Awesome. Yeah. So then it just became it became a part of my demo when I was an AE. Like, OK, I'm going to qual qualify you and ask you questions like, who else needs to use this system? What happens post sale? What does that team use? And so now like a, a solar client, they have their sales team and they have their operations or installations team. And that, that operations team is typically using spreadsheets or nothing at all. And the process is really broken from pre to post sale. And so that's just one example of how teams have been able to use it um, in the same instance and really just help automate that process and make it better. It really, to me, feels that you guys are almost take. Have you ever uh, played with the software Pipe Pipeify? It's it's yeah okay. yeah <laughs> okay. So in my so maybe just explain a little bit. Pipeify is kind of just like this. Imagine like a Trello board, and you move these cards from left to right, and each. Uh, stage is a step in the process and sometimes you can't move it to a certain stage without first filling out information. So maybe you'll move the card from one place to the next in the process and it's like, no, no, well, first you need to, to schedule an appointment with this person. Um, so so what is the appointment date and, and you know, what are notes of a call? Like, I, it, could, it could force you to fill in certain information. Therefore, yeah. your team now can go through a process. And yeah. in, in my mind, like, I feel so much that you guys are kind of uh, taking parts of that. And that's almost what the opportunity pipeline has turned into where yeah. it's, it's so much more than just this, this sales process. It's this entire process, a business process and something that I've been fighting for for so long that I really, really, really hope that you guys implement would be like moving it from one stage to the next can actually say, Hey, you can't move it here until you fill out these three required fields because <laughs> In my mind, that is literally taking all of the – I tried using Pipeify, but it's just <laughs> one more thing to throw on to clients to be confusing. And yeah. it's like you guys are already using copper. You're already so used to it. You're already used to moving things from stage to stage that I think that would be the end-all, be-all where – uh, we would then be able to say, okay, so we moved it from this stage to this stage. Now we know for a fact, if it exists in this stage, it has the proper information it needs for us to run an automation that could take care of stuff. Because sometimes yep. we'll run an automation – it's missing information and then APIs start failing and crashing and things don't work because it's like we're missing the value key here. We're missing this and this and this. Sure. So, sure. And I know that you can't speak to any of that, but it's just like in general, <laughs> um, in my mind, I feel like that's really differentiating you guys substantially because you could, your copper already has this aspect to it that is process focused outside of just being a sales CRM. And that's, and I, and it really feels clear to me that way. And that's what makes it so different in a way as well. And why, why I've jumped on board as much as I have. So <laughs> I think one of my favorite releases from last year was when we require, or we released, um, required fields mm -hmm. upon lead conversion. Yes, I so, want it. That's exactly what I want. To, I want to talk to you about. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so tell, so tell me what's on I your mind. I can't talk about our roadmap publicly. Yeah, of course but, not. Of course uh, not the roadmap. Yeah. But like, I want to hear yeah. how you guys are, are using that because we that is yeah. exactly what you are saying is in a sense what we've been testing this theory on. So yeah. what we have for so many of our clients set up is 
you have a bunch of leads sitting within leads. And once you click convert, it requires you to put in, say, initial appointment date, initial appointment time. And yep. you're not able to even convert that lead until you fill that information. Because when they yep. convert that lead now, we then just send a, a calendar invite to the customer <laughs> and we start doing all this other automation along with it. And I'm wow. like, that is, it's magical because there's no way to to mess that process up. You physically yep. cannot mess that up. And from the automation side, which is what we love so much, you can yes. do so much with it. And every client that we've implemented this in, it has worked f beautifully and there have been no issues yeah. and that initial <laughs> appointment scheduling. So it's like, let's take that and let's just do it for every stage in, in the process. Cause it, sure. I, it's just, and I'm sure it, I love that you guys see that, that you're doing that. Cause that means <laughs> that there's probably something there. What have yeah. you guys used as some required fields just for uh, maybe that lead conversion just internally or maybe that you've seen some some customers yeah. do? Great question. And I'll, I'll say this is very much version one. So mm -hmm. that's where I'm going to stop talking. But yeah. Um, yeah, it was it was really cool because like that was obviously a need internally. And then when it served our customers well. All, you know, high volume sales teams that have uh, a lead gen team and that are converting that lead into an opportunity. Um, they'll use it for things like we need to put a required value mm -hmm. in if we convert the lead, um, a required number of seats, mm -hmm. or what is the demo date that's coming up? Is the demo status scheduled? Because mm -hmm. then all of this information feeds into very robust reports that our management team live mm -hmm. and die by. So as you can see, you know, missing information, when was the demo date? Is the demo scheduled? Our management team is looking daily. How many demos were scheduled? Did they complete? This information was missing a lot of the time. So required fields have just been huge um, for us internally and for our customers that have a similar process. So, so when you get to a point of possibly having too many fields going on, especially having a company as large as you are, <laughs> And then yeah. you must have upper management saying like, hey, well, we want this information, this, this, and this. And now yeah. all of a sudden, you know, to convert that lead, for example, what happens if you have 30 required fields and you're like, this is, this is like, <laughs> this is, this is hampering my ability to even do my job at this point. We only have five, which I think is a very fair mm -hmm. number. Okay. Um, and is, and those are the required things that we need for our reporting to function as a business and okay. to make sure that we're facing towards a goal. So I think that they kept that in mind and we've done a really good job of keeping our fields lean. So in my opinion, we don't have, you know, things that we don't use. Um, so they'll, they'll audit that and take a look, you know, from time to time, make sure that we don't have anything in there that's not being used. Can you, can, can you give me a little bit of, cause this is something that, that we have some difficulties with, with some clients and are trying to improve upon it. How do you, mm -hmm. how do you audit that? How do you look at it and say, Hey, you know, <laughs> we have way too many fields going on here. Do you just look at how many are actually filled out and say, Oh, well, you know, 80% of the time it's not filled out. So let's just ax this field. Or is it more like, well, this is important information that we need. It's too low in the list, so people are never seeing it. Like, do you have any idea into the audit process or maybe just fields you've seen kind of vanish that you thought was a good idea at first, but it ended up not being? <laughs> yeah, I think it just gets to a point where we grow out of the fields we were using before okay. or we're evolving as a company. So, um, or just systems that we no longer use or mm. don't rely on as much anymore. So I remember there was a time that we used Intercom to produce our lead score. Um, and, you know, that's now evolved greatly into Marketo doing that for us. So mm, um, that field is no longer in the system. Yeah. So you got, you've you mentioned Marketo quite a bit now. Um, yeah. Adi Karasi, what, what are you using Marketo for? That's, that's email outreach in some regard, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. So, yeah, customer nurturing. So um, it could be uh, a current customer. It could be a prospect. Uh, my favorite are re-engagement emails. So we have a big announcement or, um, you know, every six months we might send re-engagement email to say, hey, you took a look at Copper at one point in time. Typically six months is probably good enough to decide if your chosen system is working or not. So we'll have a lot of success with reactivating uh, prospects that way as well. And that just happens automatically through Marketo. It's great. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, because that's definitely a more robust solution. And it, it is tough, though, because some of these tools, I think even Marketo, um, jumping in at a very small business using it might be a little bit of overkill. Sometimes you kind of need this level, <laughs> level of data or, or layer of data 
um, yeah. to get benefit enough from it. So it's so yeah. interesting to me because like the teams and, and we've had this conversation before as well, that when you guys first started, you were definitely uh, the SME, SMB uh, space and it mm -hmm. was really focused more on the smaller businesses. But as as you guys have been growing, getting more money and you've been moving upstream, which naturally makes sense, but you yeah. haven't forgotten the, the small business space. And it's this is a conversation that has come up so many times across the board. I've talked to Salesforce developers about this even and it's just like so what's so interesting is Salesforce went and they they immediately like when they were able to get an enterprise they went that way and it makes sense that a lot of these companies focus on that because you sell one 1,000 seat client in enterprise or one 10,000 seat client in an enterprise and you would have to sell you know 10,000 or not really 10,000 but like uh, 4,000 or 3,000 small businesses to, yeah. to get that same amount and how maintaining and the customer support involved with 3000 businesses is just way too much. So there's yeah. this fine line, but I think what we've been seeing lately, which is really interesting is that I, I think Salesforce is starting to see these other players come into the field, like you guys, for example, and you, and let's be realistic. If someone gets on your platform at 10 seats, for example, and they're a quick growth startup company and they end up growing similarly to you guys to four or 500 seats and then maybe a thousand or 2000. Are they really going to at that point after been using you guys for three years, switch over to Salesforce or are they going to stay on your platform? And I think Salesforce is so comfortable in the enterprise space and the large business and, and large medium business that they let the small business fall to the wayside. But hey, a lot of small businesses are, are the ones that eventually become the larger businesses. And, and the large business <laughs> enterprise businesses are actually some of the ones that are going out of business because they can't pivot because they're going too slow. And like even just look at Amazon, how how large they grew out of nowhere. So imagine you guys got Amazon as a client early on for whatever reason. Like, you know, it, it, they would probably stick with you when because yeah. they, they've been using you for so long. So Bring me through a little bit what that transition has been like, and then how do you still uh, build the tools and the feature set that I guess small businesses can appreciate? Um, and then how do you how do you? It's tough because you need to build these large features in for these medium and large businesses. How do you still do that without yeah. just you know making your smaller clients upset? I think that's probably one of my favorite things about Copper is that our CEO John Lee has made it clear that. Um, SMB customers will will always be in our system, and okay. we love that. And we don't want to forget about them. We want to keep catering to those customers, but we're also just very naturally moving up market, mm -hmm. and it's really exciting. It's I really loved seeing the inception of new teams that handle um, new bands. Like we have a Velocity team that handle um, you know, our, our SMB customers, we now have a mid market team that's going after our larger customers and, uh, and our product engineering teams have done a great job of really reinforcing the system and making sure that it's ready for mm. that, that go up market action. It's, it's been really cool to see it live. And, and what have been some, I guess, the largest things when you're trying to sell a, a mid market or, you know, small, large business, what are some of the, what, like, it's interesting here, what, what are their needs versus the small business needs? Like when, when you jump in the platform, I'm sure you, the way you sell the platform is different in general when you're talking yes. to them. Yeah. Um, it's obviously a, a much longer sales process mm -hmm. and you're typically just, you know, you're ripping someone out of their current instance is typically a Salesforce and, you know, they're mm -hmm. knee deep. They have integrations that are working. They don't like the platform, but they just realize it's going to take a lot of effort and time to move. So why should we even consider moving to a new system? Mm -hmm. um, and so that team, that mid-market team has really refined their process to make sure that we're doing thorough evaluation um, building um, demo environments to show them what it could look like for their team, making sure it's workable and usable with their integrations. All of that is a part of the pre-sale process, and that just elongates that process so much more. But um, you know, when they win, it's it's really special. It's mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah, I, I remember uh, the partner call that we had, and you guys showed some awesome companies that you have on board. And I'm sure a lot of that is public anyway, because it's a it's a big win, right? To to say yeah. uh, the, the clients <laughs> that you've got on. So it's mm -hmm. exciting to see you guys move more um, up up market. And yes, of course, like there's certain features that you guys come out with with like um, the the multi currency and things like that. Which yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to benefit from that as a small business <laughs> or my small business clients. But it's it's clear, and you understand why there's such a need for it. Um, 
in in general in order for you to get to that space. Because to get to a certain space, like you need to be doing business in in maybe different countries and you're dealing with different currencies at that point. And uh, it's it's definitely an interesting to see like how the platform has been changing because of the needs of these other markets. And are we able to leverage and utilize this uh, for our smaller business clients? And sometimes yes, and sometimes no. And, you know, sometimes (laughs) we just have to live with that. And that's, and that's totally cool. Um, so I'm, I'm super happy to hear that you guys are planning on staying focused on the SMB market because I, at the moment, it feels like there's a very special, it, it has a very special place in my heart at the moment where it's like less than 50 employees, you know, owner operated a lot of the time. And when you, when you overhaul their business and you allow it to grow and scale, like yep. you really feel like you made a difference in, in, you know, this person's life and their employees lives. Whereas yeah. a lot of the time, like there's a growth company, a startup that's happening and they have boom, they got $10 million in venture backing. It's like, it's not as fun to really help them grow because they're expected to grow. They're expected <laughs> to, to break things and, and do things, you know, crazy and everything. So yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. And I think John, our CEO being a serial entrepreneur, you know, he's been mm-hmm. that small seat customer. Mm. Uh, that's how he even came up with the idea of a system that, you know, catered to such a, a tight Google integration. Mm. And it's been so cool to see customers that I sold, you know, in 2015, they're now case studies on our website uh, oh. and we've done two with them, you know, in the beginning yeah. getting in the now yeah. with how they've grown with the system. And I just, you know, that was a part of my original interview here, just him saying that he really wants to change the world and help people grow and help these businesses grow. And mm-hmm. I think that'll always be our focus, no matter, you know, what the company size is. But again, it's been really exciting to see us go up market. Yeah. yeah that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm going back to a conversation we had a while back when we were kind of going over demos and things like that when you're helping me sell. Um, and it was so cool <laughs> to see, you know, someone like you who's, who's sold the platform so many times, like little tidbits that I've taken from, from the way that you sell it and how we can sell it. And yeah. I remember you spent a lot of time in Gmail using the Chrome extension on the sidebar yeah. there. And yeah. I remember at that point, I think you said, you know, I like day to day, I use this probably... 85, 90% of the time. And I have a question for you. Are you still using the extension 80, 90% of the time? Or are you actually using the actual uh, site more often now, the more you're kind of getting into these processes and and (laughs) involved there? That's a great question. Yeah, I'm definitely more in the web application. Mm -hmm. And I think that's purely because of my change in position. Okay, Um, makes sense. I was always in the extension as an account executive, just because like emails were coming in, I didn't need to leave to go do what I needed to do, like add a task to my calendar or send an email back with a template. Um, look up our, our most recent call that was all within the inbox. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm typically looking at pipeline management. So the Kanban view is super helpful for that. Reporting is all in the web application. So um, yeah, spending more of my time uh, online. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and that makes sense. And that I, it was kind of a preemptive question that I was asking you because I figured it would be that way because I realized yeah. the same with me. When I'm just doing sales, <laughs> I'm very much so in in you know in my email and in that sidebar uh, but the more that I kind of do other aspects of the system and other parts of my business I'm definitely jumping in and actually loading up copper and jumping around that area quite a bit yeah um, so uh, there's a couple of things here we we've been interchangeably saying prosperworks and copper many times throughout the <laughs> conversation uh, it, it's funny it, it's so funny too because naturally as we were talking about when you were first getting involved and in starting there we were talking prosperworks and yeah. then as we're talking more about where it's at now it's copper we've almost been using this time line, uh, you know, the name change is an actual point shift within the company. Um, it's very, it was cool for it to naturally just happen. It wasn't us just slipping up trying to say copper, but actually saying prosper it was actually a purpose behind it. So you're totally right. Yeah. I didn't even realize that was happening, but you're <laughs> nailed it. <laughs> so, so my question to you is what is your feeling toward copper? And I want to hear, I want to hear from when you first heard it before you even okay. Before you even knew what it meant or what was happening, just like bring me through all of the emotions that happened and, and what your thoughts were. Um, okay. So initial thought, when I heard name change, um, I had a friend who recently went through something similar where they rebranded and their marketing team was just not ready. So <laughs> they saw they weren't ready for the SEO changes. The yeah. lead now, oh my gosh, it just went so down and it was a huge hit to the company. Um And so that was my initial thought. I was like, oh my gosh, are we ready for this? Mm -hmm. Um, But then talking more with our marketing team and understanding the vision behind it, I mean, they have done such an incredible job. I mean, we, they gave us every tool that we needed. So that really eased my worry. Okay. (laughs) 
Um, and being on the other side of it, I could not be happier with the name change mm-hmm. and the brand. And it just, it feels like, um, it's, you know, breathes some life into the brand. And it was really interesting to see the story behind it. Uh, our CMO put, uh, all of our competitors logos on, um, uh, one page and told us to, you know, pick out where CrossWorks was. And, we didn't really realize there were a lot of blue logos mm-hmm. in the CRM space. Yeah. <laughs> so it didn't really stand out. Um, and so that was one of the reasons behind it. And then what was also funny is when we would call into prospects, we'd have to say, Hey, this is Brittany from prosper works, you know, like live long and prosper because they couldn't understand what we were saying. Yeah. Oh, then, okay. <laughs> yeah. A lot of our customers thought we were prosper prosper crm Mm -hmm. or proper like it was so there were a lot of very valid reasons behind the brand and name change but um i think it all came together really really well and it really pops i love it yeah and and it's interesting because i was just on the last uh episode well the last episode that was or is about to be released rather um Mm -hmm. i was talking to a branding company and we were talking about i I actually threw uh at him i I explained to him prosper works and then copper and i explained i sold him on why the the rebrand and everything and I wanted his two cents on it as, as a marketing and branding company, like what his feeling is. And it's funny because like he had never heard of Prosperwork. So he's like, what's so interesting is that when he sees copper now and he's going to look into it, he's like, now yeah. I just see it as copper. Like the new people that come and see you, yeah. they're just going to see you as copper. And the story yeah. is, is copper. <laughs> yes, your existing customers, you know, the 20,000 or however many companies that are have been using it and saw that shift happen. Copper yeah. felt super weird at first. And I'm sure it still feels quite weird for some people as well (laughs) but it's like you guys are you guys are I think there's still so much more growth to come and the majority of your users are going to come after right now and they will just know you as copper and that's all that they'll ever know you as and it's just such an interesting thing to take a step back and and I think the color scheme as well is just a fun thing because it's like the the first thing that I saw and thought of when I was really running through everything you were doing with that embracing this this hot pink this hot pink is this this primary color (laughs) is like a you don't see many companies doing that and then b like look at T-Mobile with that magenta color and you have uh, John Legere going with this t-shirt this this magenta t-shirt with this sport coat on top of it and going to these like important events and he just doesn't care and um and you start seeing this color now and thinking of a company because because of it and is exactly what you guys are saying is all of these companies are using blue and like cloud yeah. we're playing on like sales and cloud we're in the cloud yeah. now and did it and blue is a cloud color and it's just yeah. blue gets so overused and yes you guys had like a a purplish blue and there I think there's a point where you guys either shifted from blue to purple or vice versa and now you guys have just totally gone and I love the mint accent as well that it's yes. like it is yeah. so it just it really it it's different and I like that and it's exciting so <laughs> Um, Even the meaning behind it, like the the two dots on the logo mm-hmm. um, represent connection and relationship. So this ties into the relationship era that we were really focusing on as yes. an organization. Um, and then uh, obviously copper is a semiconductor that generates energy between two things. And it's been a currency for thousands of years. So it's real mm-hmm. and human and timeless. And those are things that really represent our values and philosophies as a company. And, and those dots too, just from a uh, logo perspective, you can, I, 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 one of the things that I love the most is I think when Google did that rebrand from that, from the um, San, or no, no, just the Serif G that they had yeah. to then the sans serif G that looks almost yeah. like a, you know, ABCs, like very childish in a way. But the cool thing is they, they very quickly started making it so it, it animated and it moved and it could turn into a circle and it could like form and do the stuff and animation came into play and animation is actually part of your brand in a sense and your logo and when you see stuff. So you guys now have those two dots that can bounce around or I even I saw in some of the uh, some of the things that you guys have made, you use a bunch of dots around there and you can tell that those dots are the logo's dots just kind of spun into a pattern. And when you can do stuff with your logo and build patterns out of it, you start seeing this material, this marketing material, and you see like, oh, that's copper right when you see it. That's just, and you just yeah. see it as that. And it's so cool. Um, <laughs> obviously you guys have the resources to do a brand, rebrand proper. And, uh, but even so it's, it's, it's been very wild to see. I, did you see, um, oh man, what just happened with ConvertKit? 
in their no. Seva, their Seva rebrand. Wait, what? So, so this is it's bananas. So they spent <laughs> about a month pushing through that they're rebranding their company from ConvertKit to Seva, and they're really yeah. focusing on you know community, and they want to be like that content creators uh, versus like ConvertKit, which is very much like based on conversion. Like, no, we want to be a resource for and. and um, so Seva, I think it means selfless service in, in Hindi and a couple other languages. And wow. they were really pushing it forward. And the logo rebrand looked very nice. And, and they they purchased the site. I'm sure Seva.com was quite expensive, four-letter word. And all of this stuff they went through. And the day before they launched the rebrand, and they had told all their partners and affiliates, update all of your site content to these logos, do a mass name change for ConvertKit and replace it with Seva for SEO. And all this stuff happened. The day before they launched the new site, they said, we've made a terrible mistake. We're <gasps> not changing our name. No. And yes. So the, the issue is they got some people fighting back on them saying that, this selfless service, this this you know Hindi word that you're using, it's a very religious meaning, and it means so much. It, it means so much more than what you guys are kind of making it be. It's supposed to be like you're helping people at such a core, pure level, and like all they were just like they realized that they had made a mistake where they didn't dig deep enough into what it truly meant, and it offended a lot of people. So they just overhauled and re and they pulled everything back. So new logo, but it doesn't say Seva. It says ConvertKit. They're like, we're keeping the name ConvertKit. I thought oh, they were playing a joke on me as a partner. They're like, uh, you know, just letting you know that we're actually not changing. Sorry about that. I'm like, you have to be joking. Like you're messing here, right? Because this is right when you guys announced the rebrand and everything. And I'm like, wow, these two massive companies are like doing a big rebrand. So yeah. that was just absolutely wild. And and I'm just bringing that up since, simply because we were talking about rebranding and stuff. I think it's just a, a crazy thing that it happened. Um, this is entirely off topic, but something similar. Did you hear about IHOP changing yes. their name and then faking it? Yes. And they changed it back? Yes. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and that like that sounded like it was a very big marketing ploy and things like that. Like they're great with, <laughs> with that type of thing. And you almost start yeah. wondering, like, I, I was wondering kind of the same thing with like Sava. Like, did you guys just jokingly do that? Yeah. But then, but they realized, no, like we wasted, you know, thousands and tens of thousands of hours of our partners <laughs> updating content on their site that go back. Like, oh man it was a massive thing um but but regardless i think it's so cool what you guys have done with copper <laughs> and i'm i'm very much behind it it's a lot easier to say and uh, I think something that some of your team had mentioned as well was internally you're using the PW moniker, the shortened uh, initials everywhere. And it's kind of strange where you're taking this company name and now it's really just known as PW. No, no yeah. different than Infusionsoft is just IS. And uh, yeah. someone from the outside looking in, it's like, what the heck is PW? What the heck is IS? And you're not you're not shortening copper to, oh, C, you know, just C. No, you're not. Like you just say copper. It's short enough and everything. Okay. So, yep. yeah, so I, I don't know if there's anything else, maybe I, there's so much that we can talk about and I'm sure we can continue talking <laughs> forever about it. And this has been awesome. Um, I, I want to ask you a question and then kind of let you talk about anything that you want to talk about. Um, okay. But so in terms of software as a service, I'm sure you've used so many different pieces of software throughout the course of your career. And I'm really curious what you are using the most right now at Copper or maybe in your personal life. Is there anything that you're using like project management? I don't know if you guys are even internally using something like that and maybe Asana or something like what, what is the software stack that you guys use and what do you love to use most aside from Copper? You can't, you can't choose Copper because that's of course up there. Oh, great question. Um, let's see. Okay. So being on the customer side of things, um, which I hadn't before, um, I've been using something called Tatango. Are you familiar? No, no. Okay. So this is uh, basically what our, what our customer success team uses. Um, and it's uh, a retention software tool. So it links into our billing system. It can basically tell you, hey, this, this client is on red alert. They are using only 20% of their licenses. They only log in weekly and you should probably contact them. So oh, wow. it really, yeah. So it's kind of cool that we've been, uh, we, we actually built an integration with Tatango into Copper. So we pull a lot of this data over for the salespeople to use. So just what they need, like five or six pieces of information. But mm -hmm. um, I've been living in here a lot. And it's so cool to see just the other side of things. I feel like the, the veil has been lifted, just moving from new business to current customers. And this is a great tool to 
been really, really helpful for us mm. um, on, on the client side. That's that's very cool. Yeah, it, it, when you have that large of a sales team, I'm sure there's some massively cool. You're just telling me about what, what is that other one where it actually record the conversation? Oh yeah. Okay. So this is another thing. Um, gong. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I think there was one point when I was managing a kind of executives where I had 12 people on my team, which was just crazy. Um, and so I couldn't be on every closing call with a new rep or just to review how their demo was progressing week to week. And so I could go in my own time and listen to calls they had had with customers. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it's just, it's really nice. They actually, they had you're able to put in keywords too. So you could say, okay, I want to pull all conversations that talked about closing or that talked about Salesforce or talked about X. So you could program these keywords in and use those to build your list and then go through and listen to those recordings. So it's been really helpful from a coaching perspective. They're a great company. So is there, I, I just in general, I'd be curious, like, are you guys using anything for project management? Um, no, we, we very much drink our own champagne. Okay. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I, I love saying that it's, it's really cool to see, um, like I mentioned before, like marketing onboarding, mm-hmm. um, they have these very, very specific workflows. Like one thing that's really cool is, um, when we close, uh, a client of a certain size, the account executive will sit down with their point of contact and, um, fill this form out with all the questions that the onboarding manager will have to make that experience the best and and most successful. And so they'll, they'll talk about what their goals are with the system, um, you know, what the, the current state of things is, what they want it to look like, mm-hmm. um, what integrations they might have in the future. And then that form is submitted and it creates an opportunity automatically in our onboarding pipeline mm-hmm. and then assigns it to one of the onboarding managers. And that's really been great too, just to have that automation, which I know you love, yep. uh, really bridging the gap between pre and post sale. And, so. and I think that's something that that's so interesting and makes me excited as well, that it's like, I, I know that I can use Copper as part of the project management aspect. Mm-hmm. Um, I yeah. think like in terms of like tasks, when I'm onboarding, it's normally a very custom, highly custom project that I kind of need some tools that can go pretty deep and have like dependencies and understand how many days this is going to take and everything like that. Um, yeah. So like that's where we're using Asana for that type of thing. But I love hearing that you guys are using Copper because that also shows that you are planning on improving that aspect of it, which is what I'm yeah. pushing on other. Like I would love if I, so I have a couple <laughs> clients right now that are using the project management pipeline within Copper. Okay. And at a certain point, they're going to get large enough where I may feel like we need to actually move over to proper project management software. But my goal mentally is to never <laughs> have to do that. If you guys yeah. build out the things that are needed for it, then I maybe yeah. never need to get them off it. And then that's just <laughs> one less thing that they need to learn. So sure. it's this back and forth, which like I'm embracing all the software that I can because that's just the way that I am and I want to know everything that yeah. exists. But yep. for certain customers, it's like they don't need to freaking learn Asana. Asana is confusing as hell <laughs> to jump, you know, you know, but it's like you need it sometimes it, depending yeah. on the type of company you have. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, I mean, I think that the fact that we use it internally just makes it all that much better mm-hmm. because we're focused on improving those those yeah. processes too. So most yeah. definitely. <laughs> uh, I have yeah. a quick question about uh, 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 Intercom and Zendesk because this is something I've seen like in a lot of software as a service companies. Like everyone has Intercom for for sure. I guess kind of that live chat aspect, and I'm sure like. Yeah tracking pages when people are, you know, looking at your site and they're about to buy and everything like that. But then yep. you guys are also using Zendesk. That's your actual core help desk and also the community yeah. that you guys run on. So yeah. is it like, are you using, is it those two things? Are those the two main things that you're using for, I guess, the support slash uh, chat aspect of the system? And is it normal to be using a mixture of those two versus just say using Intercom for everything? Because Intercom, you know, has everything else. And then similarly with Zendesk, you guys are mixing and matching when both tools have the same, you know, solution. So I want to hear what made that decision for you guys. So Intercom is only used pre-sale. Okay. Um, yeah. So very different functionality in terms of how we use it. Intercom, we, if someone's browsing on the website, we can then chat with them as a bot. And then mm-hmm. that can turn into a converted lead to an opportunity. And then we can also using intercom track when they last logged into ProsperWorks, how many times they've logged into Prosper, or sorry, Copper, wow. Um, 
So that's, that's what it's used for. And then Zendesk, we only use for current customers. So I guess, no, actually trials can write in too. Okay. But yep. they'll actually they'll push that back to the account executive if it's pre-sale. So mm-hmm. yeah, that's more for ticketing. Like that's all, that's all that we handle in Zendesk. Ticketing okay. and yeah, like we have our, our entire support team on that system. I don't really know much about Zendesk, honestly, because I'm not involved in that part of everything. But okay. yeah, that's how I understand that they're used. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, because yeah. I, I almost feel like Intercom is like this quick moving startup that like everyone uses them. You just you just kind of know who they are and what they can do. And I remember seeing uh, a while back, you had shown me a couple of things and it was pulling some data directly from Intercom uh, yeah. based on how many times they visited the site and things like that. And you were actually pushing that into custom fields within Copper. Yeah, it's purely uses like the chat bot when someone's perusing the website. That's it's really cool when mm. you know when someone's like, yeah, I would love to chat, and an SDR just hops on the phone and calls and so yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's great. That's really interesting. Well, yeah. cool. Uh, your this has been awesome. Um, <laughs> your story has been fascinating too because this is the first time I've actually been able to dig uh, deep <laughs> enough to really understand. Because you need to take it from the standpoint too with me is like. I've only ever been self-employed that I don't even know what it feels like working for a company and learning from it. And I know there's so much knowledge that I've given up from doing that. And that's where I look to people like you and mentors to just like, you know, see how, how was it from you? What did you learn? What did you take from old companies (laughs) to where you are now? And it's, it's super helpful for me to live vicariously through you guys. So, um, this has been great. So if someone maybe wants to reach out to you, I don't know how big you are on social media or if you even want people reaching out (laughs) to you there, but where can people maybe go to find you? Yeah. LinkedIn is great. Um, I'll send you my link so you can put it on the podcast. But Perfect. yeah, just Brittany Perez and I work at Copper, so it should be pretty easy. <laughs> Great. Hey, thank you so much for your time. This has thank been you. awesome. And we'll definitely have a call in the future to kind of catch up as, <laughs> as things grow and shift and change. I think that'd be awesome. Sounds this good. Would be awesome. Thanks so much, Alex. Great. Absolutely. All right. Well, I'll talk to you later. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye now. All right. Bye. This is Alex Bass with Analysis Paralysis. Thank you so much for listening to another episode. The funny thing about podcasting is there's really no standardized way to leave reviews and to really support kind of the creators. I'm doing this simply because I enjoy talking to people about this type of content and I love sharing it with you guys as well. There's a lot of work that goes into editing the episodes and we spend a lot of time listening to them and reviewing them and pulling out teasers and everything. So if you appreciate what we're doing, please consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts. You can go to iTunes. I have a link aparalysis.com forward slash review. It's always tough asking for this type of thing, but genuinely, it's the only thing that could really help us thrive and grow. We don't have a massive community, but we have uh, many of you that really want to just help, and this would really, really help. So thank you so much for listening, and if you're interested at all in automation, efficiency, CRM, business process, then feel free to reach out to me directly at Alex H. Bass on Twitter, or you can email me at abass at aparalysis.com. I would love so much to talk to many of you. Some of you have already reached out and we've had awesome, awesome conversations. All right, thank you so much.